Right, so good evening everybody to our prayers for this evening. Um, I was just saying to Jennifer, I've been a bit in the same position that she was in a, 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 a few weeks ago, that nothing was coming. But anyway, I, I started looking at different books that I've got. And this is this book is Surprised by Grace and it's Parable and, Parables and Prayers by Susan Derber. And she is um, quite high up. She's a reverend doctor. And she um, is a minister of St. Columbus URC at Oxford, but she's also the joint reform chaplain to the University of Oxford as well. So, she, and she's been a minister in Taunton. So she's a URC minister, but she, she's written quite a few books. So this one, I just, I was looking through, and this is a parable that I don't particularly know, um, which is why I've chosen it this evening. Um, and it's Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30. And it's the weeds among the wheat. He told them another parable saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while people were sleeping, an enemy came and sowed weeds in the middle of his wheat and went away. And when the green stalks grew and the grain came, then the weeds also appeared. The householder's slaves came and, and said to him, the householder's slaves came and to him, Lord, wasn't it good seed that you sowed in your field? Then how come it has weeds? But he said to them, an enemy did this. But the slaves said to him, do you want us to go out and pull them up? But he replied, no, in case in pulling up the weeds, you might dig out the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will say to the harvesters, first gather in the weeds, tie them up into bundles and burn them and then gather the wheat into my grain store. Now this is what Susan Derber says. This is one of the story parables in which the key to a good reading probably lies in finding the surprise. And the problem is that we have heard the parables before and part of our reading gear switches off when we start reading. We're not innocent readers, we're watching repeats. And that makes us hard to surprise. So she continues. Walking recently behind, beside a field of wheat in late summer, singing the sting song, Fields of Gold to Myself, and reflecting on the idyll of the English countryside in a thoroughly romantic kind of way, I suddenly remembered this parable. I had noticed some strange plants growing in the middle of the field large, green, spiky, and evidently weeds. I realized as I looked that it was perfectly sensible to leave them there. There weren't many of them compared to the wheat, and even getting to them would have meant trampling over much more wheat than you'd be likely to save by pulling up a few weeds. So best all round to leave them there, and I got on with the walk. So a bit of homely and sensible, sensible advice. As a metaphor for the kingdom of God or for the health of the human psyche, this would then say the very sensible thing, that it's sometimes best to learn to live with the parts of yourself that you don't like so much. It would be to say that sometimes we can be at our best by accepting those things within us that are not all we would want them to be and surrounding them with the good rather than just rooting them out. It would be to know that if each of us is like a field, well, it's not all going to be gold, but that's okay. Most of us learn to live with parts of ourselves that has brought us and others pain and which we can't just destroy or forget. But somehow we accommodate and grow around them. This is a kind of wisdom. But is there something more to be heard in this parable than that? 
The slaves in this story are very keen. The householder seems remarkably laid back. He sows the seed, but then like everyone else, he sleeps. It's the slaves who notice the weeds and draw them to his attention. And they are slaves, remember. It's not really their worry. They want an explanation. How did the weeds get there? Didn't you plant good seed? The householder gives them an explanation, but that doesn't satisfy them. They want to do something about it. Shall we go and pull up the weeds? But the householder says no, and he doesn't just say not yet. He says that someone else, the mysterious harvesters, will deal with it. Could this be the surprise? The slaves are ready to do their work, even rather zealously, but the householder says that there's nothing you need to do at all. It's someone else's work, not yours. Of course, quite a bit of me reacts against this reading because I've often been told, and indeed told others, how important it is to take action now against something. And sometimes it is important. Even the presence of slaves in this story reminds me that I'm not doing enough writing enough letters, going on about, about campaigns to challenge the places and situations in the world where slavery is still a reality. So it's still a surprise to hear that perhaps sometimes there is another temptation, the temptation to think that I have to sort out every mess and pull up every weed. Sometimes I have to leave sorting out a bit of the world to someone else. I have to learn that sometimes my desire to pull up weeds becomes a weed itself. Righteousness can become self-righteousness and even wrongly placed and timed. Wickedness and cruelty. Sometimes I have to let it go and let it be and hope that when needed, someone else will be as merciful to me. Now, I've just read that verbatim, but I must admit, I'm finding it quite difficult because I think I push against the weeds in me. I try to uproot them and I try to get rid of them. I don't succeed, so perhaps I have to learn to accept myself, warts and all, as they say, and learn to live with the me I am. <clears throat> God accepts and loves me as I am. So I must learn to love myself. However, I still think I could do better. Then there is this surprise that she talks about. That righteousness can become self-righteousness. So do I give myself a pat on the back for something that I've done. Perhaps I have to wait for a mysterious harvester to come along. Maybe this is the Holy Spirit who will guide me rather than me thinking that I know best. Who will, when the time is right, gathered up the weeds in me so that the good wheat in me can be harvested and used well. And she finishes with a prayer. <clears throat> so let's pray. God, when I long to save the world and sort it out, let me remember that you are sovereign of all. God, when injustice and evil are obvious and brazen, help me trust that you have seen them too. <clears throat> God, when anger stirs me to act and when indignation rises like fire, give me patience to consider carefully what I should do. God, when I cannot understand why judgment is so slow to come, Restrain me from making myself the judge of all. But hear my prayer for justice. Strengthen my hand to work for good. Stir in me holy anger when people suffer. 
and in your own time, come and sort it out, please, God. Amen. And then I was looking in another book, and I've just got this book today, actually, and it's a book that um, Marian L. Olson used on Sunday, or it's one of the ones that she used on Sunday. <coughs> So I've just had it delivered today. Now, this is a meditation. I'll just have a drink of water. <clears throat> and it is actually to be used during communion. So if you can think that you are in that situation, that you are about to take communion, because she does make that, it's mentioned that the writer mentions bread and coming to the table at the end. Then have that in your mind. And this meditation is called, You Touched Me Then. When I fell, I grazed my knee or banged my head or hurt my arm. You put on a plaster or rubbed it better and told me it would be all right. You touched me then, as you did, and as you did, so did Christ. When I was in pain, you used your skill and applied your fingers and manipulated my body until you made it right. You touched me then, and as you did, so did Christ. When there was something wrong and part of my body would not work or was causing distress, you tested and probed and used your skill with a scalpel. With my body in your hands, you touched me then and as you did, so did Christ. When I was depressed, and life was dark and empty. You put your arms around me and told me you love me and kindled a light within my soul. You touched me then, and as you did, so did Christ. When I was in anguish, in anguish, watching a loved one suffer, stunned by disappointment, expecting bad news, you sat with me, holding my hand, supporting me with your silent touch and told me it would be all right. You touched me then and as you did, so did Christ. When grief was raw and my life blown apart, you held me while I cried a river of tears into your shoulder till I could weep no more. You touched me then, and as you did, so did Christ. When life was a burden and work was stressful, or things had not worked out as planned, or my body was never going to work properly again, or grief and disappointment still nagged, you touched my shoulder letting me know that you understood. You touched me then, and as you did, so did Christ. When I come to worship, bringing all my needs and concerns, which you may or may not know, and do not always need to know, you take my hand in yours, you say, the peace of the Lord, God's healing, shalom. You touch me then, and as you do, so does Christ. When I come to your table with my faults and my fears, my needs and my hurts, just me as I am now, holding out my open hands, I feel the touch of bread. I know your acceptance of this me, that I am. When others touched me, so you did then. As bread touches me, so you do now. You touch me. 
O Christ, and make me whole. Amen. So we're going to have our final prayer now. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, I bring before you all the people that we have been worried about or that we are glad for. We have spoken about them at the beginning of our meeting. You know about them and why they are in our thoughts and prayers today. We are thankful for this time of prayer and fellowship. We pray for the new venture Long Causeway Church is thinking of taking up to help people in vulnerable positions. May we all pray about this, that it will be a success and that it will be the right thing for the church to take up. We pray for those people who now feel that not this church or any church is not what what and what we are and what we do is no longer for them. Be with them, Lord. Support them as they seek a new way without the family of their church. We pray for ourselves in a moment of quiet. Let us bring our worries and our hopes to you. Heavenly Father, we are not worthy to come into your presence and yet you welcome us. You love us and have always loved us, no matter what has happened in the world from the point of you making it. We are sorry. And yet we still make mistakes and we go on making mistakes. Forgive us, Lord. And now as we come to the end of our evening together, bless us all, Lord, and keep us safe through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So if you want to unmute yourselves and then we'll just try and say the grace together. <clears throat> The, the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, evermore. Amen.